Hello, adventurers of all shapes and sizes. My name is Chance, welcome to my spellbook, and thank you for tuning in to a very interesting episode of our Feet series. So, technically speaking, this is a redo of a previous feat we've covered, namely uh, Aberrant Dragon Mark. Uh, this is the second version of that. So basically what happened is Wizards put it into publication under the Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron and there was a lot about that book in particular that they took issue with so it led to them redrafting a couple of feats, um, a couple of the races, uh, things along those lines so technically it's play tested and in doing so they re-released this feat. Uh, I'll leave the original version in the playlist st still so you can check it out. I much prefer that version to this version, by the way. Um, I kind of see what they were trying to do, but this is ridiculously complicated for a feat. So hopefully I'll be able to kind of help you out a little bit. That being said, let's take a look at this description and try and break it down a little bit. So the prerequisite is to have no existing dragon mark. Uh, we will be covering the full dragon mark list once we get into the races, and then after that we'll be covering the greater marks as well, so just keep an eye out for that. So this feat reads as followed. Increase your constitution score by 1 to a maximum of 20. You learn a cantrip of your choice from the sorcerer spell list. In addition, choose a first level spell from the sorcerer spell list. You learn that spell and can cast it through your mark. Once you cast it, you must finish a short or a long rest before you can cast it again through the mark. Constitution is your spellcasting ability for these spells. When you cast the first level spell through your mark, you can expend one of your hit die and roll it. If you roll an even number, you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to the number rolled. If you roll an odd number, one random creature within 30 feet of you, not including you, takes force damage equal to the number rolled. If no other creatures are within range, you take the damage. You also develop a random flaw from the aberrant mark, and we'll go over those in a bit. So if you've checked out the previous video, there's a lot in common with it. Um, you get the cantrip, you get the first level spell, it's sorcerer base, constitution's your ability modifier, but it's the second part that changed entirely. In the previous edition, you basically sacrificed one of your hit die and you were able to upcast the first level spell. I thought that made a lot of sense. I don't quite 100% understand why they decided to go this route, but whatever, all I can really do is report on it. Now let's take a look at those flaws. So they're calculated by rolling a die 8. That's kind of the random way of choosing one. Um, there's really nothing to stop you from picking one or coming up with one on your own. If you decide to go that route though, uh, just run it past your DM. To be honest, I would run this whole feat by your DM um, just because there's a lot of really weird implications for it. So without further ado, let's actually go through these flaws. So if you get a 1, the mark is a source of constant pain. If you roll 2, your mark whispers to you, its meaning can be unclear. Um, number 3, when you're stressed, your mark hisses audibly. Number 4, the skin around the mark is burned, scaly, or withered. Number 5, animals are uneasy around you. Number 6, you have mood swings anytime you use your mark. Number seven, the look changes slightly whenever you use the mark. Number eight, you have horrific nightmares after you use your mark. So I actually find a lot of these to be pretty extreme depending on who your DM is. So uh, for example, your mark is a source of constant pain. I would argue that when it flares up, you're going to be rolling disadvantage on a couple checks potentially. Um, number two... It, it could be an interesting plot point to be fair um, so I really do like that uh, looking at number three I don't like this one because it's just I don't like it when these feats negatively impact the real world you're already really using a pretty important resource on getting this feat in the first place so having a hissing mark for a feat that in my opinion isn't quite the best you could select I mean it's good so maybe but I don't know let me know what you think down beneath um, the skin around the mark is burned, scaly, or withered. I don't consider that one to be too bad, just because, yeah, you know, um, you can cover it up pretty easily. The one where it says animals are e uneasy around you, number five, I really, 
I don't like that because it implies you'd have disadvantage on animal handling checks. I know it doesn't say that expressly, but I can make an argument for it pretty easily. Um, it's, I don't know, those are probably the worst ones. Um, with the exception of number 8, having horrific nightmares, I would make an argument that a cruel DM would impose uh, a level of exhaustion whenever that happened. So. It's really worth having like conversation with them in advance. In terms of the one I would tr or the ones I would try to avoid, um, number one, number three, number five, and number eight would probably be the worst ones. So I don't know. Once again, let me know what you think down beneath. I'm always curious to hear exactly what you guys think. So let's actually take a look at a quick walkthrough here, just to try to simplify this to the best of our abilities here. So, plus one to con, maximum of 20, really easy to get, really easy to understand. Um, the second part, uh, you gain one sorcerer cantrip and first level spell. Uh, the first level spell you can use once per short or long rest. Uh, con is your spellcasting ability modifier, which is pretty great for a lot of builds, needless to say. When you cast the first level spell, you can roll a hit die. Um, even numbers gain you temp HP, odd numbers cause force damage to a random creature within 30 feet of you, or you if no one else is around, which is really an interesting caveat. I'm sure there's a way to kind of break this. Um, maybe something involving absorb elements might be kind of cool to play around with, but we can talk about that more a little bit later on. Um, in any case, that's kind of the three main components of this spell. I'm not going to include the random traits in the walkthrough just because um, we've already addressed it first and foremost in detail and also it doesn't expressly say it affects mechanics at all, so we're just going to kind of brush it off. Now, if you thought we were done, you would be wrong! There is another section that kind of outlines how the greater Aberrant Power, or the greater version of this mark, would operate. It doesn't specify it's its own separate feat, so we gotta cover it in this video. Well, let's do that real quick here. So, the greater Aberrant Powers. Upon reaching 10th level, such a character has a 10% chance of gaining an epic boon, which you've actually covered in a video series. I'll leave the link on one of the end cards or in the description as well, so just check for it there. If the creature fails to gain an epic boon, they have a 10% chance the next time they level. So basically, they just keep re-rolling that d10 every time they level until they get the target number and then they get an epic boon as a result. Once again, check out those videos. I think they're all kind of cool. Um, a couple of them are a little bit better than others, but for the most part, they just really help build flavor in characters. If the character gains a boon, the DM chooses it or determines it randomly. The character also permanently loses one of their hit dice and their hit point maximum is reduced by an amount equal to a roll of that die plus their con modifier, minimum reduction of one. This reduction can't be reversed by any means. So it's a pretty pretty interesting way to look at it. I, once again, I don't really know what to think or feel about this spell. I've never playtested it personally. I've never been part of any games where it's been tested. So let me know what you think down beneath. That being said, let's get into my personal thoughts about it. I am very divided. I think it's a cool concept, but by that same token, I feel like they tried too hard to overbalance it. And it led to a lot of weird mechanics that I know for a fact a lot of people are going to misinterpret. By default, I don't think I'd allow this in my game just because rolling that hit dice, figuring out what's going on, it seems like a lot of things to keep track of and then you incorporate epic boons into the mix and it gets to this weird point where a character wants a certain one but it's probably going to be the most broken so I don't know, it, it's all really weird for me personally, I would need a strong reason to allow this in my game. It might be a cool option to give people as like a, a quest reward, for example, but by default, I don't really like it. That being said, in terms of who should use it, honestly, anyone with a high constitution modifier, I think ideally the Barbarian could really gain a lot from this. 
especially if they grab something like Armor of Agathis, for example. I think that'd be a good first level spell for them to grab. It's not concentration, improves their survivability a little bit, deals a little bit of damage, and just looks cool, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe Chaos Bolt as well, possibly. Kind of depends what you're playing, but I really, I really do like the idea of having a tankier class taking a little bit of magic just to really diversify their arsenal. That being said, if you have any ideas, thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, stories, uses, please put it down beneath in the comment section. I really do appreciate it. And if you like that cool hand-drawn picture of Sips and you like your own hand-drawn D&D picture, please check out the guild hall to figure out exactly how to do that. Thank you so much everyone, I really do appreciate it, and as always, happy adventuring.